Hey. We are live. I know I'm a few minutes late. Um, Kel Surprise. Thanks for popping in. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hello, hello. How you doing? How you doing? Um, loads of folks. Hey. Um, thanks so much for joining us back here. Happy Friday. <clears throat> I hope you've had a good week. Um, if you've had a great week, good. Celebrate. If you have not had a good week, it's very nearly over. Um, yeah. Let's crack into it, because I have a few poems here. Um, I'm eager to, to read out. There was low, I think I saw a few tweets. I may not be on Twitter next week. But I saw a few tweets from people. I don't know how else you would send requests to me. So I'll just have to be pig ignorant to them. Um, but I saw a few requests from for a few poets. I might have found one or two of them. Um, so hey guys, thanks so much for joining again. I'm gonna crack into it. Um, I think I have an Ezra Pound. Is it an Ezra Pound? Um, here's one for lockdown living. Anyone who is finding it less than joyous. Ezra Pound, and the days are not full enough. And the days are not full enough, and the nights are not full enough, and life slips by like a field mouse not shaking the grass. Ezra Pound. That's a lovely one. I might come back to it. Uh, futility. I meant to last week. Um, I had got a message. I completely up to my eyes, as it were, uh, up to my proverbial uh, memories with with uh, with stuff every week, and um, I never managed to get back to things or get. But I, I did receive a message saying somebody, I think a fan, had to put down a cat last week. So I'm very very sorry. I was very sorry to have read that. Um, off the top of my head, I can't go and check now because it'll close the feed. But um, I heard it, uh, somebody somebody had to put a cat down. Um, so this one this one is dedicated to yourself. If anybody had to put a, a pet down, specifically a cat, in the last two weeks, or possibly more, um, this is Wilfred Owen's futility, which is very sad. Um, futility. Move him into the sun. Gently its touch awoke him once, at home, whispering of fields unsown. Always it woke him, even in France, until this morning and this snow. If anything might rouse him now, the kind old sun will know. Think how it wakes the seeds, woke once the clays of a cold star. Our limbs so dear achieved, our sides full nerved, still warm, too hard to stir. Was it for this the clay grew tall? Oh, what made fatuous sunbeams toil to break earth's sleep at all? Move him into the sun. Actually, don't do that. Techn like, I mean, literally speaking, don't do that. Especially if your cat died in the last two weeks. You shouldn't have him out at all. Um, you shouldn't be hanging on to him. And you shouldn't be keeping him in, in direct sunlight. And you should know that. So don't do it. Can you place your phone so it's symmetrical? It's bothering me. You know what? I could. But now that you've said that, that's that's your... like. You're trying to put order on nature right there. That's just how my house looks. I can try. My God. Um, how would I do that? Oh, yeah, it's yeah, fine. It's like a little bit wonky. I don't think... I have this balancing on a weird thing. That's as symmetrical as it's gonna get. That is to say it's perpendicular. Well, it's not even perpendicular, it's still sideways. Um, James Joyce, uh, a 
flower given to my daughter. F frail. <clears throat> a flower given to my daughter. This one's music. Um, frail the white rose. And frail are her hands that gave. Whose soul is sere and paler than time's one wave. Rose frail and fair. Yet frailest. A wonder wild in gentle eyes. Thou veilest my blue-veined child. Isn't that a lovely one? He had some lovely poems. Um, is it one which mentions his son? Um, it's beautiful. But kind of walking on the shore. I can't remember the name, but I don't have it on my hand. Um, So how's your week been? You can tell me. You know? Um, you can tell me. Here's another one for lockdown. It's a nice one. And yes. Happy Friday. Cheers. It's been interesting. You had a sad week, an awful week. I'm sorry. Starting a new job, living in the epicenter of the pandemic. It's been mediocre. <laughs> it's been strange. A lot of stranges and awfuls and bad. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. Ah, oh, sinus infection. I'm sorry. Send, I'm sending all the love out to you. Uh, to all you folks. I'm hungover, so not the best. Hey, enjoy, the, enjoy the sadness of that hangover. It is a real, raw, vital sadness. Um, it is living. Um, keeping quiet. I think this is an Aruda poem. Pablo, it is. Sorry, of course it is. Pablo Neruda. Uh, I wasn't familiar with it until recently. Uh, it's a stunner. And, well, it's just, and also, it's very appropriate for these few weeks. Months. Fucking years. <laughs> Whenever lockdown began. Um, Keeping Quiet by Pablo Neruda. Now we will count to twelve, and we will all keep still. For once on the face of the earth, let's not speak in any language. Let's stop for one second and not move our arms so much. It would be an exotic moment without rush, without engines. We would all be together in a sudden strangeness. Fisherman in the cold sea would not harm whales, and the man gathering salt would look at his hurt hands. Those who prepare green wars, wars with gas, wars with fire, victory with no survivors, would put on clean clothes and walk about with their brothers in the shade, doing nothing. What I want should not be confused with total inactivity. Life is what it is about. I want no truck with death. If we were not so single-minded about keeping our lives moving and for once could do nothing, perhaps a huge silence might interrupt this sadness of never understanding ourselves and of threatening ourselves with death. Perhaps the earth can teach us as when everything seems dead and later proves to be alive. And now I'll count up to twelve and you keep quiet and I will go. Isn't that nice? It is very nice indeed. Um, I think I had a few in this collection. I was going to pull out. So what else is new, folks? 
What else is new? I had some um, some lovely love poems here in this collection. I might come back to them. It'd be a bit early in, in the evening for love poems, to be honest. Um, so I'll leave that there. I'll leave that there. Um, what do I hear? Two poems. Um, if you're familiar with I Too by Langston Hughes. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes. But I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen, then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. This is a poem I was not familiar with until recently. By Imtiaz Darker. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. They'll say she must be from another country. When I can't comprehend why they're burning books or slashing paintings, when they can't bear to look at God's own nakedness, when they ban the film and gut the seats to stop the play, and I ask why, they just smile and say, she must be from another country. When I speak on the phone and the vowel sounds are off and the consonants are hard and they should be soft, they'll catch on at once, they'll pin it down, they'll explain it right away to their own satisfaction. They'll cluck their tongues and say, she must be from another country. When my mouth goes up instead of down, when I wear a tablecloth to go to town, when they suspect I'm black or hear I'm gay, they won't be surprised, they'll purse their lips and say, she must be from another country. When I eat up the olives and spit out the pits, when I yawn at the opera in the tragic bits, when I pee in the vineyard as if it were Bombay, flaunting my bare ass, covering my face, laughing through my hands, they'll turn away, shake their heads quite sadly. She doesn't know any better, they'll say. She must be from another country. Maybe there is a country where all of us live. All of us freaks who aren't able to give our loyalty to fat old fools, the crooks and thugs who wear the uniform that gives them the right to wave a flag, puff out their chests, put their feet on our necks and break their own rules. But from where we are, it doesn't look like a country. It's more like the cracks that grow between borders, behind their backs. That's where I live. And I'll be happy to say... I never learned your customs. I don't remember your language or know your ways. I must be from another country. Imtiaz Darker. Um, leave that there. Um, I have loads of Seamus Heaney also. Here's a uh, W.B. Yeats. I suppose this will ease us into the love poems if we if we get back there. Um, when you are old. When you are old and grey and full of sleep and nodding by the fire, take down this book and slowly read the dream of the soft look your eyes once uh, your eyes had once, and of their shadows deep. How many loved your moments of glad grace, and loved your beauty with loves false or true. But one man loved the pilgrim soul in you, and loved the sorrows of your changing face. And bending down beside the glowing bars, murmur a little sadly, how love fled and paced upon the mountains overhead, and hid his face amid a crowd of stars. Um, 
I had wanted to read a Stephen James Smith poem for a while. It's a wonderful Irish Dublin-based poet, um, spoken word poet, um, spoken word artist. It's st stunning and um, there's a wonderful poem actually I shared on Twitter not too long ago that he had written. Um, it was kind of concerning the lockdown and, and this kind of moment of pandemic. Um, it's a beautiful poem called Ireland, My Ireland, uh, which is, I suppose, flows like the river, the rivers that he, um, that he comes back to throughout the poem. Um, it's beautiful. Um, this is from uh, Fear Not, which is a book of his poetry. And on the bus, I just thought this was wonderful. Um, I wouldn't be able to do a lot of his work justice, I feel, uh, in my own mouth, but um, I'll give an attempt on the bus for Ben by Stephen James Smith. I was on the bus and this sunset, it screamed at me, reminding me of life, reminding me to shine. And I wanted to tell someone to look at it and gaze at it with me, but I paused and the view, it had passed, confiscated by concrete, stolen by gravity. So I phoned a friend on a 50-50 chance that they would see my end, and I sent my friend a picture of it verbally. It was like a neon sign, I said. No, that is shit. It was like someone had gotten all the flamingos and pureed them, and concrete clouds, dark and dull, had puke-pulped guts glazed on their undersides and drips that drop into my eyes. I speak no lies, but the centre, the core, it was like fire. Yes, okay, I know that the sun is fire, but it was really like fire that was friendly and kind to touch. And that sunset, it touched me. So let it touch you and accept love. And accept that things, they are intended to be given like beauty or heart or life, but accept love. That's accept, A-double-C-E-P-T. Um, um, let me just think here. There was a there was a request for St Kevin and the Blackbird. Um, which happens to be one of my favourite all time poems, and definitely up there with them. For my one of my favourite Seamus Heaney poems, hands down. Um, it's from uh, The Spirit Level, which won him the Nobel Prize for Literature in 95. Um, and it, it references, so it references a, like a saint of Ireland who made his, her, his hermitage in Wicklow, County Wicklow, in a place called Glendalough, where, as the myth of his canonisation goes, one of his miracles that he managed to pull off is um, he used to have a thing there called Kevin's Cell, like this little rock hut. Um, and there's a few, this Kevin's bed also was a cave down there that, that rebels in the old times used to, used to hide out in because infantry couldn't really and cavalry couldn't make their way through those hills. Um, so it's, quite an, it's an interesting historical place. Um, but as the story goes, he was praying in this cell with his arms outstretched and a bird landed in his hand and he was moved um, to not move and to hold still. And as the miracle, as the story goes, uh, he held still until the eggs were hatched and the, the, the chicks had, had grown and flown away. St. Kevin and the Blackbird. And then there was St. Kevin and the Blackbird. The saint is kneeling, arms stretched out inside his cell, but the cell is narrow, so one upturned palm is out the window, stiff as a crossbeam, when a blackbird lands and lays in it and settles down to nest. Kevin feels the warm eggs, the small breast, the tucked neat head and claws, and finding himself linked into the network of eternal life, 
is moved to pity. Now he must hold his hand like a branch out in the sun and rain for weeks until the young are hatched and fledged and flown. And since the whole thing's imagined anyhow, imagine being Kevin. Which is he? Self-forgetful or in agony all the time? From the neck on out down through his hurting forearms? Are his fingers sleeping? Does he still feel his knees or has the shut-eyed blank of under earth crept up through him? Is there distance in his head? Alone, and mirrored clear in love's deep river. To labor and not to seek reward, he prays. A prayer his body makes entirely, for he has forgotten self, forgotten bird, and on the river bank, forgotten the river's name. I do love that. It's, um, I don't know, it's just rich with them. Um, is it John Montgomery? Um, I heard him once referred to as the dark beneficent, beneficence of God. The darkness, the giving darkness of God. Um, oh, my, um, Sweeney. I'll stick on the nature buzz. <clears throat> this is an excerpt from Sweeney Astray. So it's a, it's an, it's a about maybe 14th or 15th century poem, um, epic poem, Irish epic poem based in County Antrim or based on a, on a king, a story of a king from County Antrim in, um, in like the 15th century, 14th, 15th century. Um, and the story goes, Sweeney, Mad Sweeney, he's referenced in as a TV show that Neil Gaiman wrote um, or produced. Mad Sweeney, sometimes spelt like Sweetna, S-U-I-B-H-N-E. Anyway, he pisses off a, a cleric one day. He pisses off a holy man, um, like a bishop, who's, um, he's a bit of a, like a, a bit of a bastard to this to this uh, holy man who's on Sweeney's in his lands measuring out space for a monastery. He doesn't take American gods. That's the one. And he annoys this this cleric. He actually kills some of his some of his priests, some of his um, missionaries. Um, this would have been based in a time when missionaries and kings, or missionaries and, and you know pagan warlords would have been at times not terribly friendly with one another. Um, and so this holy man curses him and he believes that he's a bird. Uh, curses him into the belief that he is a bird and he flits around Ireland suffering loneliness and isolation and coldness, etc., etc. I believe that's the story. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, and so that, that poem it was was um, translated by Seamus Heaney uh, into uh, Sweeney Astray. Um, it was the end of the harvest season and Sweeney heard a hunting call from a company in the skirts of the wood. This would be the outcry of the wee felon. Come to kill me, he said. I slew their king at Moira, and this host is out to avenge him. He heard the stag bellowing, and he made a poem in which he praised aloud all the trees of Ireland and rehearsed some of his own hardships and sorrows, saying, I've heard him recite this, where he refers to it as Sweeney praises the trees. The bushy, leafy oak tree is highest in the wood. The forking shoots of hazel hide sweet hazelnuts. The alder is my darling, all thornless in the gap 
some milk of human kindness coursing in its sap. The black thorn is a jaggy creel stippled with dark sloes, green water crest in patch on wells where the drinking blackbird goes. Sweetest of the leafy stalks, the vetches strew the pathway. The oyster grass is my delight and the wild strawberry. Low set clumps of apple trees drum down fruit when shaken. Scarlet berries clot like blood on mountain roan. Briars curl in sideways, arch a stickleback, draw blood and curl up innocent to sneak the next attack. The yew tree in each churchyard wraps night in its dark hood. Ivy is a shadowy genius of the wood. Holly rears its windbreak, a door in winter's face. Lifeblood on a spear shaft darkens the grain of ash. Birch tree, smooth and blessed, delicious to the breeze. High twigs plat and crown it, the queen of trees. The aspen pales and whispers, hesitates. A thousand frightened scuts race in its leaves. But what disturbs me most in the leafy wood is the to and fro and to and fro of an oak rod. Cool. Um, yeah, that's 1500s, I suppose. It's a good, nearly 600 years old. What did I say I was going to read? Oh yeah, I have a few more. There was a request by, um, I did see some requests for my Angelo. Um, it was a beautiful poem, uh, Touched by an Angel, by my Angelo. We, unaccustomed to courage, exiles from delight, live coiled in shells of loneliness until love leaves its high holy temple and comes into our sight to liberate us from life. Love arrives and in its train come ecstasies, old memories of pleasure, ancient histories of pain. Yet if we are bold, love strikes away the chains of fear from our souls. We are weaned from our timidity in the flush of love's light. We dare be brave and suddenly we see that love costs all we are and will ever be. Yet it is only love which sets us free. Um, that is my Angelou, touched by an angel. Um, going to Target today, do you all want anything? Well, kid. Yes, I was trying to think of something. A salad spinner. That's right. I cannot, I cannot dry my leaves quick enough. Let me tell you. That's what's been on my mind. Trying to rinse my fucking salad leaves. Nightmare. Um, thank you, Kit, by the way. I await, I await its arrival. Um, <laughs> die, pot. What you guys, uh, what you guys up to for the weekend? Come on, bright. Tell me, tell me all. Tell me some crazy shit you're gonna get up to. Tell me some debaucherous stuff. Thrill me. Thrill me with your um, plans. What are we looking at here? Talking about food prep. 
Harrison Keller. It's a lovely poem called Supper, which I read. I thought it was quite sweet. Um, nice little love poem, Supper. You made crusty bread rolls filled with chunks of brie and minced garlic drizzled with olive oil and baked them until the brie was bubbly and we ate them lovingly, our legs coiled together under the table and salmon with dill and lemon and whole wheat couscous baked with garlic and fresh ginger and a hill of green beans and carrots roasted with honey and tofu. It was beautiful, the candles, the linen, the silver, the sun shining down on our northern street, me with my hand on your leg, you, my lover, in your jeans and green t-shirt and beautiful bare feet. How simple life is. We buy a fish, we are fed. We sit close to each other, we talk, and then we go to bed. How's that for life? This is um, from A Hundred Love Sonnets. It's another Neruda poem. It's translated uh, by Stephen Tapscott from the Spanish. And it is Sonnet 94, um, I believe. If I die, survive me with such a pure force, you make the pallor and the coldness rage. Flash your indelible eyes from south to south, from sun to sun, till your mouth sings like a guitar. I don't want your laugh or your footsteps to waver. I don't want my legacy of happiness to die. Don't call to my breast, I'm not there. Live in my absence, as in a house. Absence is such a large house that you'll walk through the walls, hang pictures in sheer air. Absence is such a transparent house that even being dead, I will see you there. And if you suffer, love, I'll die a second time. Quite lovely. Noi. Where am I going? I think I had a, a T.S. Eliot um, poem. I do loves me some T.S. Eliot. This is from Ash Wednesday. It's just the first. It's just... Um, Part one. Read the Bible. I could do that. I could read the Bible, but I, I think the passages I'd pick out would not be the ones that um, you'd be thrilled to hear. Wednesday. Because I do not hope to turn again, because I do not hope, because I do not hope to turn, desiring this man's gift and that man's scope, I no longer strive to strive towards such things. Why should the aged eagle stretch its wings? Why should I mourn the vanished power of the usual reign? Because I do not hope to know again the infirm glory of the positive hour because I do not think, because I know I shall not know the one veritable transitory power, because I cannot drink there where trees flower and springs flow, for there is nothing again, because I know that time is always time and place is always and only place, and what is actual is actual only for one time and only for one place. I rejoice that things are as they are, and I renounce the blessed face and renounce the voice, because I cannot hope to turn again. 
Consequently, I rejoice having to construct something upon which to rejoice and pray to God to have mercy upon us. And I pray that I may forget these matters that with myself I too much discuss, too much explain, because I do not hope to turn again. Let these words answer for what is done, not to be done again. May the judgment not be too heavy upon us, because these wings are no longer wings to fly, but merely vans to beat the air, the air which is now thoroughly small and dry, smaller and drier than the will. Teach us to care and teach us. Teach us to care and not to care. Teach us to sit still. Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Pray for us now and at the hour of our death. from Ash Wednesday T.S. Eliot as you know the man himself I was going to read you um, I was chatting to the very wonderful and genius um, and very gifted writer also as well as um, as well as a theoretical astrophysicist cosmologist Katie Mack, the one and only Dr. Katie Mack. Um, and I was requesting if I can read an excerpt from her book, her upcoming book, The End of Everything, um, which I'm excited to do. So maybe next time around, um, I might give that a bash. I'm going to leave you with this because. Um, yeah, Katie Mack's a legend. Um, I used to annoy Katie Mack a few times we've met, had a chance to chat and just like melt her head with questions, like a, I suppose like an like an like an annoying uh, school child or toddler in the back seat, um, asking about heat death and, and vacuum decay. Um, she's wonderful. Um, yeah, I'll read you some Ovid because people were enjoying um, a bit of Ovid last time around. This is the Four Ages, which is very much at the start of the book and it's kind of, it's after creation, I suppose. Um, there's probably something in between. Yeah, there's creation and then it goes to the Four Ages, which describes, you know, the imagined uh, Four Ages of the world. And this is Ovid, of course, the Roman poet. First to be born was the golden age. Of its own free will, without laws or enforcement, it did what was right and trust prevailed. Punishment held no terrors. No threatening edicts were published in tablets of bronze, secured with none to defend them. The crowd never pleaded or cowered in fear in front of their stern-faced judges. No pine tree had yet been felled from its home on the mountains and come down into the flowing waves for journeys to lands afar. Mortals were careful and never forsook the shores of their homeland. No cities were yet ringed round with deep, precipitous earthworks. Long, straight trumpets and curved bronze horns never summoned to battle. Swords were not carried, nor helmets worn, no need for armies, but nations were free to practice the gentle arts of peace. The earth was equally free and at rest, untouched by the hoe, unscathed by the plowshare, supplying all needs from its natural resources, content to enjoy the food that required no painful producing. Men simply gathered arbutus fruit and mountain strawberries. Cornel cherries and blackberries plucked from the prickly bramble. Acorns too, which they found at the foot of the spreading oak, oak tree. Spring was the only season. Flowers which had never been planted were kissed into life by the warming breath of the gentle zephyrs. And soon the earth, untilled by the plough, was yielding her fruits. And without renewal, the fields grew white with the swelling corn blades. 
Rivers of milk and rivers of nectar flowed in abundance, and yellow honey distilled like dew from the leaves of the ilex. When Saturn was cast into murky Tartarus, Jupiter seized the throne of the universe. Now there followed the age of silver, meaner than gold, but higher in value than tawny bronze. Gentle spring was no longer allowed to continue unbroken. The king of the gods divided the year into four new seasons. Summer, changeable autumn, winter, and only a short spring. The sky for the first time burned and glowed with a dry white heat and the blasts of the wild winds froze the rain into hanging icicles. People now took shelter in houses. Their homes hitherto had been caves, dense thickets or brushwood fastened together with bark. For the first time also, the corn was sown in long ploughed furrows and oxen groaned beneath the weight of the heavy yoke. A third age followed the Silver Age, the Bronze Generation. Crueler by nature, more ready to take up menacing weapons, but still not vile to the core. The final age was iron. The floodgates opened and all the forces of evil invaded a breed of inferior metal. Loyalty, truth and conscience went into exile their throne usurped by guile and deception, treacherous plots, brute force, and a criminal lust for possession. Sailors spread their sails to the winds they had tempted so rarely before, and the keels of pine that had formerly stood stock still on the mountain slopes presumptuously bobbed in the alien ocean. The land which had been as common to all as the air or the sunlight was now marked out with the boundary lines of the wary surveyor. The affluent earth was not only pressed for the crops and the food that it owed. Men also found their way to its very bowels and the wealth which the god had hidden away in the home of the ghosts by the sticks was mined and dug out as a further incitement to wickedness. Now, dangerous iron and gold, more dangerous even than iron, had emerged. Grim war appeared, who uses both in his battles, and brandishing his clashing weapons in hands, bespattered with slaughter. Men throve on their thefts. No gust was safe, excuse me, Men throve on their thefts. No guest was safe from his host. No father secure with his daughter's husband. Love between brothers was found, but seldom. Men and their wives would long for each other's demise. Wicked stepmothers brewed their potions of deadly wolfsbane. Sons would cast their father's horoscopes prematurely. All duty to gods and to men lay vanquished. And Justice, the maiden, was last of the heavenly throng to abandon the blood-drenched earth. There you go. That was 2,000 years ago. That's how bad he thought it was. Has it got any better? Um, poor lad. Um, yeah, so listen, I might leave it there. Um, read the Tumblr post about yourself next week. I don't think I have it in me. I really don't. Um, I will, um, I'll tell you soon. Enjoy the weekend. And um, yeah, if you've had a good week, great. Um, celebrate it. If not, uh, consign it to a grave, a liquid grave. And um, I will catch you again, hopefully next week. Um, I'm good, thank you very much. Um, I will, yeah, stay safe and look after yourselves. And um, the pandemic's not over, I suppose. Um, thanks for joining me. Happy Friday, happy Friday afternoon, evening, morning 
wherever you are in the world, and um, or Saturday morning or Saturday night. No, it wouldn't be Saturday night. Sleep well. Thanks again.